I bid you welcome again to this extended moment of grace that allows us to be together in this way, moment by moment, our last gathering but moments ago. And so I direct your memories to the last moment we share together in which we explored the soul's union with the being just after or relatively after an experience of a lifetime upon the earth. We find our essence now gathered together as one, one being, oneness, one soul, soul's essence, soul's awareness, the flame of life, everlasting, ever-living. And here we rejoin our soul as it begins to contemplate all of the choices it has before it. And there are many. To describe the soul for a moment before we continue. The soul is not infinite, but it can feel so. The soul is finite. It is aware that there are other souls, soul families, soul experiences. It never thinks of itself as all that is, except that from certain understandings it is all that is, all that has been. And so it is a complete awareness. It is completely aware of itself and the self. The soul does not try to be more than what it is. The soul does not long to be as other souls. A soul is not an envious thing. It does not say, oh, that is a better looking soul. That is a more experienced soul. It does, however, have a reverential companionship to other souls. It references itself to them and by them. There is a relationship between all souls. Something gathers them all together. Something causes them to find family and family relationships and soul families and super souls and more conscious souls. And so there is a great respect for all of these gatherings in all of the ways that the soul recognizes itself, in all of the ways that the soul comes together. There is an understanding of something greater than soul or self. And that greatness, that is where the reverence is. And whether you will choose to call that God or God essence or all that is, the void of all, the oneness that is all, the Father or the Father's kingdoms, all of these being appropriate. There is a force, a force beyond all things, a wisdom that is beyond all things and all knowing, that which is unknowable that which even the soul in its expanded awareness and its expanded consciousness recognizes, seeks, feels, feels fulfilled in and dwells in and still, does not know or fathom its magnitude, its greatness. But the soul concentrates upon what it is, what it has discovered, where its interests are, what desires can be fulfilled. The soul is interested in service, and so it is enough. The soul does long, the soul does yearn, but not in a jealous way, not in an envious way. These, these expressions are human expressions, and they are expressions of other worlds as well. They are the expressions of a developing being. They are the experience of one that does not yet know the answer or does not yet know what is on the other side of that expression. So the soul yearns for something else. It yearns for all things creative. Because the more the creative expression of the soul, the more fulfilled it is and the more fulfilling life is. 
And so the soul yearns to be creative, to be associated with creative things and creative thoughts, creative experiences, and actions where necessary. Now the soul, in terms of being or doing, is not exactly the same. In your human form, you have certain thoughts, creative thoughts, and the more that you contemplate these, the more active they become within you, the more wanting or the more desire there is, and eventually that thought wants to do something. It wants to become something. Because on the third plane, on the third dimensional plane upon the earth, that is how thoughts must manifest eventually. They wish to be experienced. And the being, the human being, wishes to see the thoughts in action. So it contemplates something, and when it becomes important enough, it frees that thought, that contemplation, to go and make an experience, go and create something, do something, as you will often say. What can I do about it, you will say. And so the soul, being more, than a human being does not find the need to convert a thought or a desire into an action. However, where there is a strong desire, it does choose to create or allow thoughts to become expressions, experiences. And these do not need to be physical in order to be fully experienced, fully known, understood, or in order to create a memory associated with these. And so a soul can create a full dimensional experience so that the thoughts become one with the soul, so that the soul understands them. In essence, the soul dresses itself in these very fond thoughts. It immerses itself in the thought so that the thought becomes something. That something is not necessarily a physical expression, but that something is still something. It becomes the full measure of the thought. So a fully expressed thought is a creative thought, and a creative thought is a fully expressed thought otherwise known as an experience. So the soul is a specialist at creating full experiences for itself. The more creative it becomes, the fuller the experiences are. And because souls are indeed very alive and very creative, they often enlist the support, the friendship, the companionship of other souls. So just as you would have friends upon the earth, souls also come together in community. Now, there is a preference between some souls more than others, but again, not in the human sense, not in that preferential sense in which you would say, you can be my friend, but you cannot, or I prefer you, but not you, or you may come along and the other one not, not in that way. It is more as if there is a simple and very natural union that draws some souls together and others not. So there is no foresight in deciding who can come or will go or would enjoy this experience or might not. You see, the thought, the creative thought that desires the expression, the experience, it is semi-automatic. The thought itself begins to dress the soul. If you awaken in a day, and it is a rainy day, automatically your thoughts turn to rainy day thoughts. You dress yourself in attire for a rainy day. You choose certain activities or not others according to the weather. Similarly, but on a much grander scale, the soul automatically dresses itself according to its desired expression. And the thoughts begin to make manifest all things related to that creativity. Now, how does that come about? 
Well, I will tell you that depending upon the plane of expression, the dimension of expression, there are certain centers of energy that the souls are drawn to. If you will look into your own solar system, the Earth's solar system, you can see that there are certain planets that one may be drawn more here or less there. And each one of these planets offers a certain experience, different kinds of lifetimes and choices and like that. It is the same where the souls and their planes of expression are located. Depending upon the plane and the density, the souls are then drawn to certain centers of energy. These centers of energy would resemble to you perhaps a university of thought, a temple that is oriented in one way or another. You may blend, if you like, a temple and a university into one expression of being. They are schools of higher learning, of higher thoughts and of higher experiences. And so these centers of energy allow souls to dress into certain experiences where thoughts that are not physically manifest still become full experiences, so full, so precise, so exact and creative that you would not truly know the difference between something that was physical or not. Almost as if you were to see something that is such a perfect holographic example of an experience that you would not know that it was not truly made of physical matter unless you were able to peek behind the energetic scenes. And so in this way, the soul discovers more about itself and about life. Sometimes about the earth plane, but not necessarily. You see, once there has been the complete merging between the soul and the beingness, the yearning to know everything about the earth and everything that is taking place upon the earth, that is much less. And that lessening, that lessening of experience allows the soul to consider many other objectives, many other choices. And so the soul may consider a certain subject. The soul might consider philosophy for a certain subject. But the philosophy of every world or all worlds or all beings on a certain plane of experience might be the subject. And so the soul and perhaps others would be drawn to such universal thoughts, centers of energy, in which this subject could be explored thoroughly, in which the soul could immerse itself in this experience. And so there are higher schools of thought. Now, here I will give you something else for your contemplation, a slight deviation of our subject, but it will suit you well. Imagine that, just as we are saying, certain souls are drawn to the concept of a certain philosophy, for an example. There they are drawn to the higher energetic circles. And here you might have a great classroom council, if you like, of souls come together to explore the philosophy of freedom, for example. Well, in this experience, Anything and everything associated with that thought, with that subject, is fully explored in the dimensional moment rather than in the linear moment. That dimensional moment might, for instance, include a certain being upon the third dimensional earth plane in the early part of the 21st century contemplating the very subject of freedom and wondering how to expand upon that. Here, imagine this. Imagine at the very moment that many souls are gathered to contemplate what it is like to be dressed in freedom or lack of freedom and all of the philosophies associated with that. Imagine that a being such as your Nelson Mandela sitting years ago in a small cell, wondering as well as to the philosophies of freedoms in the stars that he cannot see at night. Imagine that this becomes not a linear thought of one man, 
but a dimensional thought, an idea that travels freely, exclusively and extensively to all planes. And in that moment, his one contemplation, his one lament is met by this great council of souls who is at that same dimensional moment exploring a similar concept. And based upon their amplitude, based upon their particular evolution, that thought becomes then an expanded thought. And because the thought of that one earth man years ago touches this council like a boomerang, he is now included in that dimensional thought. An answer, an epiphany, a truth, comes to him one moment later, one earth moment now. He feels transported, transcended, for he has had a moment that has taken him out of his body, out and far and beyond the stars into another plane of experience where a cell does not limit his body nor his thoughts, where he is one with the stars and with great minds and beings and souls. He finds himself in a moment of energy and energetic center that somehow has answered all of his questions, changed his destiny. And in the next moment, he is a free man, though he yet sits in a cell. He predicts the moment at which he will move beyond that cell, in which he will take a position of leadership, giving a fine example of how to be and how to think in a more expanded way. So here is but one example that I offer to you of all that takes place in all moments, that though you may watch the hours tick by, the click of the clock, and the passage of days on the calendar and month, I tell you that time is not measured in such a way, nor does a soul measure its time or effectiveness or the subjects that it considers between lives. Yet, all of life is part of that great web of life. All of life touches upon itself without hesitation, without fear. The threads, the very tendrils of life touch one another. And here, the contemplated, exalted, creative thought of one soul dressing itself in dimensional thought now affects not simply a man in a cell, an entire nation, the entire world. One creative thought dressed in itself. Imagine, sweet ones, this is a small example that I give to you, a very small one. And so sometimes Gaia is asked, and why is there suffering upon the earth? Well, indeed, there is, for a variety of reasons, some which make sense and some which make no sense at all. For at what point does suffering make sense? And yet, exalted moments can free one from suffering, from a cell, from one's own prison, be it a physical one in which one has been imprisoned, or a thoughtful one in which one has pronounced sentence upon oneself. So in this small expression you see how even a soul that is no longer truly interested in the earth, the passage of earth time, or the political climate upon one country or another still affects the earth for all is one. Some soul animates that man in the cell and that soul brings to it all that it can in every moment and in every truth. And so two tendrils have touched one another. Now we continue with the subject and perhaps you will forgive the deviation from the mark that I have taken. What choices does the soul have? What can it 
choose or experience for itself. Well, for the moment, the sky is the limit. Or the dimension is the limit, or the plane of expression is. When you look upon the universe now, or your lifetime, you imagine how far you might go. How many countries or cities you might visit. How many subjects you could possibly consider in one life how many occupations you might have, how many different ways you might reinvent yourself, but it is from a limited scope. Because as you begin life creatively and freedomly, then you begin to narrow your expression. You begin to choose whom you will associate with, a city that you will live, further limiting yourself, an occupation that you will have for this long or that length of time, limiting yourself again. Perhaps a marriage, a partnership, Perhaps you will choose to raise a family and make certain commitments to them. And so the limitations become more. And although it is a very large world, your world has become smaller. Now the opposite is true for the soul. For the soul, now the world, the many worlds, have become larger. But what it sees before it to choose from is not predicated upon how large the universe is. Where you sit now, you may contemplate how fathomably large the universe may be, or the solar system, or the galaxy. A soul's experience is different. It is measured, as we have said, by planes and dimensions. Within each dimension, there are many different planes. How many of these planes and dimensions the soul is exposed to depends upon the soul itself. Perhaps you have heard the expression that there are young souls and old souls. This has to do with experience. It does not truly have to do with when they were born. It does not truly have to do with a big bang or when the souls separated from a larger group soul or super soul. How young or old or mature a soul is has to do with how creative it has been, how much it has contemplated, how many thoughts it has dressed itself in. And this is a matter of choice for the most part. So do not think that some are more advanced than others. Some are not luckier than others. Truly, a soul is a very creative thing. And the more creative it is, the more it will experience. Now, that being said, it can also be said that a soul can be, and not necessarily, but can be more lazy than another. Imagine that a certain celestial body travels around the sun. If that orbit that it takes around the sun is more elliptical or longer than another, well, it could be said that that celestial body is more lazy than another that travels more quickly on one of the inner rings on an orbit that takes it much closer to the sun, to light. Is it that soul's choice to be where it is? Yes. For the most part, yes. So it is not a true laziness, for you would not truly say that a celestial body is more lazy than another. But were you to look upon it, it could be described in this way. So we will use this terminology very, very loosely. And here I beg you not to turn round and say to others that Gaia has said that your soul is more lazy than another. This description, however, will allow some to take experiences and thoughts and dress themselves with them truly more slowly, savoring every moment and not hurrying about the next at all. At the same time, some souls savor deeply and intensely every experience and every thought. So like a sun, it would seem to consume itself more quickly. And this self-soul exploration of any and all subjects as much as possible, turning itself this way and that way and inside out into this 
center, university or temple or another, joining with this council and with another, there are simply some souls that are insatiable in their desire to experience and to be creative and to create. And so these would appear to others as very wise, very sentient, very mature, very old souls. And by contrast, those that have had less lifetimes, less of these experiences, have less expertise to draw upon, less experience, less to offer others, perhaps, other than their hand in friendship. And so these would be considered younger souls. All of these terms are relative, I tell you. For instance, you may be a very young soul when it comes to lifetimes upon earth, but a very old soul when it comes to lifetimes elsewhere, or a certain subject that you might know a great deal about. So it is always a relative term. If someone will say to you then, you are a young soul or an old soul, do take the time to inquire in just what way that is meant. And if it were possible to explore it even further, do so, so that you do not take it as fact that someone says this or that to you. It is well worth the exploration of it, I tell you. The soul then continues to go, if it wishes, or draw to it, if it wishes, based upon the experience that it will choose. How far can the soul go? As far as that plane of expression that matches its frequency will allow it to go. So it is a little bit like a map, a little bit like a fuel tank, if you like. Each soul, based upon its experience and how well it has dressed itself in experience, has a certain fuel tank associated with that. That fuel tank measures to a certain frequency. That frequency has a range, a little bit like a scale, great highs and great lows. That range, almost as if it were a musical scale of tones, is how far, how wide, and how creative that soul can be. And that becomes a little bit like a key. It will fit into many, many locks, and some of the locks it simply will not fit yet. See? It is a little bit as if you were to have a teenager, and you would say, you can go this far, and you must be back by that hour. That is what you believe that it is able to do realistically, honorably, for that particular age. Now, in this case, there is no true one that says you can go or you cannot go. The soul is free in that way. But the idea, the frequency, would make it so that it would not truly conceive of an idea that it could not in some way accomplish. So it is not that the soul will become lost or mired in this or lost for all times. The soul will draw to it experiences that it wishes to have. It will draw to itself companionship if it so desires for those that it wishes to accompany in these experiences. And for the most part, it will fulfill that. Now, the soul is not as fickle as a human being may be, so it is rare for a soul to go here or there based upon a great thought that it has had and then say, oh, I don't like it here very much at all, I think I'll just go back. Or because it may be a little bit difficult or unexpected. Once the soul truly has a thought in a certain direction, once it is truly a creative thought, a creative thought is already worth the experience. It will see the experience through. Because, you see, the soul does not say this is better than that. It may later say I preferred this over the other, but that will be in hindsight. Once it knows the experience fully and completely, because only then will it be able to truly evaluate or to compare only with a full experience, you see. 
And so the soul does not choose that which it cannot accomplish, and it does not choose a certain timing by which it must be accomplished, and it does not decide ahead of time what that will be like. Otherwise, what would be the point in choosing that experience? For the most part, it chooses creatively, artistically. It designs an experience. And in that way, it is fulfilling. You see, this is why when the soul does choose a human life, and we will speak of this perhaps later, when it does design for itself a complete human life, regardless of what it is that it wishes to investigate, that life will be seen to completely. It is not the soul that abandons the life and say, you know what, I don't think it's working out after all. It will complete the experience. It will redesign the experience. It will reevaluate it, change it all together, turn itself inside out, offer a variety of perspectives to the human aspect that it has created, that it has given life to. Because remember, the soul animates the thought, the thought creates the experience. And so once that experience has been given permission to be creative, to be in its aliveness, the soul does not simply yank it back as if it were yanking on a string. It is a cooperative thing. And the soul, a very, very wise being, even if it is a youthful one. So the soul then contemplates ideas and expressions. The soul is always creative and pure creativity. It is pure thought, creating pure thought. It is in contemplation, in expression, in development. A soul is not bored. A soul does not become bored as you might moment by moment. There is always something to be, something to explore, something to do if it prefers, from here to there to be an active doing. And if there are moments in which it is not in pure and creative expression for its own making or discovery, somehow it takes great delight in being of service to others being of service to other souls, to other worlds, bringing anything that it has discovered to the assistance, to simply lay it on the table if need be. That is why the earth has found itself with very, very much and grateful assistance. That is why you have so many guides, by the way. It is not simply one guide that plumps you up here and there and dusts you off when life has become a little bit difficult. No. You are filled with guides and guidance on any subject matter of any desire to you. And so you draw this to you and it is this soul's perfection essence part of it that you draw to you so that the universe is always serving itself healing itself, creating itself, discovering, fulfilling itself. Every aspect of every particle, of every awareness, of every truth is disseminating itself. On beams of light, a truth will translate and travel to many different worlds, to many different expressions, landing here or there. And in the same way as earlier, we said that a seed of hope or a seed of truth would land in the mind of one Nelson Mandela is the same way that a seed of a great oak tree will land near enough to it to grow again or a thought of a soul will travel far enough to implant itself in another world that will begin to grow into its own full expression. So these are the things that the soul concerns itself with. The soul is not an idle thing. If you remember earlier, perhaps in our last broadcast, we have said that shortly upon the transition time, 
The being that is not yet merged with the soul requires rest. It requires at least a consideration or an expression of sleep. Once the soul has fully merged with all of the different aspects of itself, this is not necessary. The soul does not sleep and then wake. At the same time, it is not rushing off here or there. The soul is always in expression. And yet that expression is sometimes inward and sometimes outward, always in service but does not always appear to be in service. And so to give you a deeper expression of what that might be like, the soul can have, for instance, the experience of many different relationships. It is not only that the soul must dress itself in a physical body in order to have a loving relationship with another being. At the same time, the soul does not need to divide itself into its masculine or feminine qualities or to consider itself to be man or woman in order to have a loving relationship with another soul. There is no need for gender identification. There is no need to separate or divide itself when union is possible without doing so. In essence, that is what everyone on earth truly wants. It wants to be in union with another, but feel as if it is in love with itself. It does not want to not be this part of itself or to be more of that one in order to contemplate someone. That is simply what a human being finds that it must do in relationships upon the earth. It finds what compromises it is willing to do, can do, or must do in order to be in partnership or the approximation of union with another. It finds its complement. Well, at the soul level, that is not necessary. The soul is already in complement with itself. The soul does not lack the soul does not truly feel lonely, though it can feel alone or oneness if it wishes to. It can also feel any condition of partnership, relationship, or union, because that is a creative thought, and so it becomes a creative, created thought. It becomes an expression of being. And because the soul, although we have said it is not infinite, compared to a human being, it would seem so. So if you were to see or even remember your soul's living and longing and loving, the memory of it would seem unconditional to you. It would seem limitless to you. It would seem complete and so a soul's union with another is a full experience because it did not divide itself in half, separate itself into two, or compromise itself in any way in order to be in a living and loving relationship with another. When a soul merges with another for this purpose, all of the understandings of each soul are shared with the other. There is no need to obscure this or that, to hide any memories of what it has been, or to be embarrassed, for instance, over certain lifetimes that did not appear to go as well as had been hoped or expected. All of these have simply become part of the great library of being, the great memories of the fullness of being. Remember, there is no judgment. And so there is only the observation of what has been seen and learned and experienced. And one soul's love for the other would not deny any of this to another. It would say, look, this is all that I am and all that I have been. And the other soul, in essence, would say the same. These experiences can be quite lengthy. How long would it take you to recap to another, assuming you have had 600 lives upon the earth, a very minor amount, by the way, how long would it take you to recount the highlights, only the highlights, of 600 lives to another? 
without even assuming to think what you have learned or gained by those experiences, and assume the other soul has had a similar amount, again, a very small amount by earth standards. It is a good thing that souls do not measure their experiences by the clock or the calendar. They are measured by planes and dimensions. Now, within that frequency that we said earlier, the souls share or exchange with one another. They exchange bits of frequency, particles of light, filaments of light, treasure. Exchange them freely so that one becomes part of the other. It is a full merging. And within this they each then gain. There can be no losers in this and there is not even one that says, well, I brought a larger part to the experience. No, it is a full and complete merging of light within a given frequency. So now, how does a soul go about sharing its light with another soul? It is, as we have said earlier, said semi-automatic. The light of one based upon a frequency, a measurable frequency of light draws to it, based upon electromagnetic impulses, all other interested souls of a similar, of a like frequency, magnetic light, from anywhere within that plane of experience. It does not matter how far away it would seem to be. It is not distance that separates souls. It is planes. And so imagine planes that are stacked very lightly in the thinnest filaments of light, one on top of another, and the frequencies then broadcasting these as far as the light would go, as far as the sun's light can travel. And every wave of experience within that dimension, on that plane of experience, within a certain frequency, is attractive and excited and excitable by the souls. That is how soul families come together. They recognize one another. And once souls have had certain relationship experiences with each other, having combined memories and moments, when there is enough similarity and true desire and true companionship, they become part of the family. It is an extended family of sorts. There is a belonging associated with it. Just as when you meet someone and it is almost instantaneous. Something says, I know you, I feel you, I recognize you, I treasure you. And they become part of your almost near immediate family. Something within you says, there is a truth here, a longing that I recognize. And so here, even on the remote third dimension, if you know this to be true, then let your imagination soar now and imagine what it is like for the soul to recognize another soul, to accept, to merge with another soul now and forevermore. They then become inseparable. Imagine something that looks a little bit like a star cluster, a beautiful and perfect emanation of light. It belongs together. Is each one still an individual light? Yes. But is there beauty when it is all combined together, not also made more perfect? Yes. So this is how souls then experience relationship, friendship, companionship. Again, by planes, of expression determined by frequencies. And how do frequencies come about then? What determines what is your frequency and how you are able to broadcast it? Again, this is determined by how much, how many experiences the soul has. But there are a few other quotients here to be considered. There are many different ways for a soul to experience. Many of these are experiences of self or soul's awareness. Just as there is self-awareness, there is soul's awareness. 
Then we have said there is a group soul, so there is a group or family soul awareness. Another measure has to do with how many lives or lifetimes a soul has animated. How much has it been responsible for, as a matter of fact? How many lifetimes can one soul animate? And out of those lifetimes, how much of that has resulted in, yielded, a greater light? What has the soul learned? What has it assimilated on any or all of the worlds of expression in which it has made itself manifest? So this is not simply a sum of how it knows itself or how many earth lives it has had. This is not where you would say, well, 1,200 must certainly be better than 600. Or, I'll raise you, I've had 1,200 earth lives and you've only had 42 Venusian lives. You see, it is not that this trumps that. Instead, it is how much of all of these experiences has the soul assimilated, balanced, integrated, expressed, shared, transmitted, given to others, been in service. And so it is not that there is one particular body of wisdom that votes upon this soul and what it has accomplished as compared to another. It is all, again, almost automatic. The more that the soul has done this, the more brilliant its light becomes. It is a quotient of light. The more of these experiences that it has had, the brighter its light is. It does not need to do anything or petition anyone. It does not need to have anyone look up its records and say, but look, I have done this and been here and endured the other. It is not that. Light begets light and draws light unto itself, which then reflects it elsewhere, that it is needed or wanted and so, again, it is automatic, the fountainhead itself, the Godhead, God all that is, has seen to this and more. So the soul does not go to seek more. Now, that being said, sometimes a soul observes another soul being of great service to another, or perhaps animating many, many lifetimes, and that soul may approach another and say, I would also deeply care to share in a creative experience such as that. And so the first brighter soul may allow the other to learn from it, to merge with it, to be a guide with it, a part-time guide, a full-time guide. There are many, many different expressions and as I have said to you, although we describe but a few, few examples here, they are unlimited in their expression. Unlimited in their expression from your perception, from your point of view. One of the fastest ways for a soul to become more brilliant in its light is to draw itself near to worlds in progression, worlds in evolution, worlds that are still being made or discovered or defined, and there to offer their light. It is a little bit as seeing a bridge being built from two different sides and not knowing what will happen, how they will meet in the middle, or whether they will be strong enough, and somehow a hand or the finger of light or the finger of God upholds that one center point just long enough that the two sides meet and become stronger in the process. And so souls that share themselves in this way grow very quickly. There are many that do. There are some that desire to grow so quickly this way that they 
do not recognize that they are here upon the earth and there upon the earth, and assisting one with this and the other with that. And before they know it, they are being drawn and drawn and drawn closer and closer and closer to the earth. So that even as long ago they had somehow forgotten about the earth in this particular world's example. Without even noticing it, they are becoming closer and closer to the earth's gravitational field. And as high as they are upholding their frequencies, they are also being stretched and pulled to the field in which the earth tugs on density. For the closer one comes to a lower dimensional world, the more the pull there is in that particular zone. And so it must be with great care that souls or guides come very, very close to the orbit of the earth where souls are concerned or the astral plane or the lower dimensions of expression. Remember that we said that the souls have a great frequency, but if they are being pulled and pulled and pulled and pulled to the lower frequency so that they must dwell there longer and longer, the exercise is more and more difficult to pull oneself away from those frequencies into the higher ones again. Here we very lightly touch upon how a soul comes to have a life upon the earth again, but perhaps I tell you that that will be our subject of our next coming together. The same is true of other worlds, you know. We continue to use the earth as an example because, of course, it is of greatest interest to you. In this moment, it is difficult enough for you to imagine a life after this life or without your body or with dimensions and planes as your guide rather than clocks and calendars without adding to that mix all of the different bodies that you might manifest for yourself in all of the different worlds or planets that you might live on in this solar system or others. So perhaps you will forgive how often I use the earth as an example. It is for your benefit, I assure you. As the souls then come together in service to others, to each other, in the merging and in service to the lower worlds as they have then approached from a higher world, the light becomes brighter for those that they assist and for the soul's expression itself. The soul gathers to itself then more light. Sometimes it gathers to itself more pupils as well, those that would study with it or choose to associate with it. If many different souls were of interest to you, their light, their truths, you would wish to gather near to them. And when you felt them near, you would gather yourself to them. And so in this same way, souls become teachers Souls become masters, become part of schools of expressions, become associated with other beings such as those of angelic nature and perhaps offer themselves to masters or teachers or souls upon the earth who are of a similar frequency. And this being a great source of light for those of the earth and those in soul's expression. For this kind of light, this light that would call itself service or teaching or healing or wellness, it has a very particular quality to it. And as souls draw these experiences to themselves, their frequency expands on all ranges. And so desire itself, creativity itself, 
causes the soul to expand, to live in different ways, to become more dimensional, more experiential. In all of the different ways in which the soul serves self, it serves the whole. Souls are not what you would term self-serving. Souls are not selfish. Souls do not say, well, as soon as I have had my turn, then you can have yours. I'll go first and you go next. No. There is always a merging. There is a greater reality, a greater frequency, a shared expression, a shared experience, and enough light and more to go around. As you have already seen, the example is used of a candle, lighting another candle, never diminishing the first, but for the moment in which the desire to share itself is made known. So souls become greater. The soul's desire is to become more of the oneness that it already is. But it is not a more that adds or multiplies. It is a more that expands. And it is desire and the fulfillment of that desire that expands a soul and expands a lifetime. The more dimensional that the soul becomes, the more access to the higher realms or the higher planes of expression and experience there are. That is another way to describe the more. The soul would seem infinite to you, but within its finite plane, that is even more than you can ever imagine. The soul, in its own yearning, experiences every possible expression of that plane, every illuminated thought, and eventually its frequency becomes so much, its light soars so much, becomes so intense, that automatically it finds itself in the next plane or the next dimension, semi-automatic, based upon what it dresses itself in, based upon what it thinks, based upon life itself. And the only thing that ever began the process was creativity itself, a creative thought to dress itself in this thought or the other, permission given to that thought to express itself fully and completely, to share itself in relationship with another, to expand its family, its origin, its desires, its vistas, its panoramas. And so light surrenders to itself, envelopes itself, fulfills itself, and its brilliance then becomes so much expanded that it births itself into the next dimension or the next plane, into the next mansion of the many that there are. So you see, there is no death. Living and ever living and a variety of ways of living and here you have the soul's expression between lifetimes of the earth. Now the soul's expression between lifetimes of another world, that perhaps I would describe to you slightly different. A slight variance on the same. But to be accurate, I relate that to you now. But again, our examples for the most part, unless our topic were to change, our examples will be drawn from the earth so that they will be as realized examples for you as possible. Upon another time we will explore what other worlds have to offer and then we will bathe in a different light. Until the next moment, sweet ones, at which time I will tell you how it is that you do choose to return to earth Many of you would now say, not again and not ever. Thank you very much. I'll finish this one out, but you'll not see me round this way again. Well, certainly it is my hope that you will remain with the earth and with your guy and earth, as long as you would choose so, 
but we will explore all of the options that are available to you, so that as always you will be free to choose. I bid you good day.